Okay. What's up, family? It's your boy King Obatuna. Back again on another live. I'm here with uh, Ray. Uh, you went through a title change, Ray. Can you like, introduce your new channel or your new uh, title change? <laughs> yes, my channel has gone through a number of phases, so it's uh -huh. now connected with Uganda. <laughs> connected with Uganda. I know. Okay, so I'm here yeah. today with Ray from Connect with Uganda. And um, today we're going to talk about um, if uh, Africans uh, celebrate Juneteenth, in particular Ugandans, like not just if they celebrate it, but if they have an understanding of it, they know the meaning behind it, they understand the significance behind it. And I want to do a slight comparison of Juneteenth, which is the uh, Freedom Day for enslaved Africans abroad, uh, comparison to the uh, Freedom Day for you guys when uh, Uganda gained their independence. I want to know, you know, if there's any significance between the two. Um, even though you're going to gain your independence uh, from colonialism in recent history, I want to uh, be able to get an understanding of what freedom means to people here in Uganda and if that idea is shared from people, you know, from abroad or, or it's just, you know, something that you guys only think about yourselves. And the reason why I'm asking that is because I've met several people here who consider themselves uh, pan Africanists. Uh, they consider themselves pan Africanists and um, some of them have a, a, a good understanding of uh, things that go on in the West. So that is why I have Ray, uh, you here with me today. And uh, there's some of the things I want to talk about. So, you know, I understand, you know, uh, if you don't really have a whole lot of information on this, fine, we'll just get right past it. Because it's not, I know, uh, one thing I've learned about being here in UG is that it's our, what the, we went through it with the West African slave trade is not really that talked about, or it's not really that big of a thing here in East Africa. So, that's kind of why I want to get perspective. So you'll start off, you know, uh, give me an idea of what, what Juneteenth means to you or uh, you have any idea of what it is at all. Uh, thank you so much for having me, King. So I read about it, honestly, when I've heard of it before. I know it's independence for the Black people in America or the African Americans. That's when you uh -huh. were set free, you know, from the slavery. So it means a lot to you. You know, I read about it. But in school in Uganda, they never taught us about Juneteenth. So if you ask a day-to-day -day Ugandan, they don't have an idea of what Juneteenth is. Yes, we know like some freedom fighters. Excuse my light. <laughs> uh, we know some freedom fighters, but we do not know, we do not exactly know the history of how you came to be freed, you know, how you fought and all that. So it's something okay. I had to read about and educate myself. I've also heard of 4th July, but 4th July really doesn't mean anything to us or even you as African-Americans. Juneteenth is what matters a lot because we've been fighting for freedom, fighting for your rights. Even till today, it's still a fight. So and that's what I came to learn. And I think absolutely then it's a day to be celebrated because it reminds you guys of where you've come from. I mean, the, the fight is still going on. But then I can really appreciate and understand why it's very important for you guys. Okay. All right. So I want to ask, um, do you think that Juneteenth should be something celebrated uh, across not only in the diaspora, but also here on the continent as well? Do you think that it's a, a holiday or not just a holiday, but a day that needs to be recognized amongst our community? Or is it something that only uh, former enslaved African people should really uh, uh, associate themselves with as far as uh, Juneteenth? Yes, I think it's a day that should be celebrated. But most importantly, I think it comes back to the education. One, they would have to educate it to us in our history. Because, for example, they taught us about how the British colonized Uganda and what independence means to us, for us as Ugandans. So if they taught us about what happened to African-Americans, yes, we, we do mm. learn a little bit about slave trade, but we don't learn a lot more about what happened, you know, when our great grandfathers reached there, how they fought, how they eventually gained independence. You know, okay. we don't learn about these things. You know, they don't teach us about like Martin Luther King or your heroes or Marcus Garvey, you know, they don't, you know. So if they did wow. teach it to us and then, you know, incorporate it in our holidays as well, I think that would be really great. And it would also be a way to inform us that us and you guys are one. 
because that's not taught to us as well, you know? We hear of you guys like Americans. <laughs> <laughs> but I think yeah, yeah, it would be important because this would show us that these are actually our people. They left home and went there. So we should all be together, but we were separated. So if that was incorporated in history in like primary school class, and then you go to celebrate it, then it would be it would be more important to us as well because we do understand it. But at the moment, we don't. We don't understand it. That's why we look at you like all oh, your foreigners, you know, because right from school we are, we don't learn it like that so do you think if uh this stuff was taught in school do you think if it was taught in school would there be a, um, a huge gap of information that uh, would be bridged as far as african diasporans and continental uh continental africans understanding each other in that aspect do you think that if it was taught in school that gap would be filled or do you think that that's not really something that would, would change anything that gap would be filled because school is very fundamental you know it lays the basics like when you're young four years old to 12 years old all that you know is things that you've been taught at school so it's the basis for everything you know that you're going to even learn later in life when they teach it to you when you're still young you won't forget it you know you learn it and you won't forget it so for me okay. in my own opinion i think it's very important when it comes to education because education is going to shape who the people become, you know? What they teach the yeah. kids when they are younger at school or even at home, eventually it's going to shape how they think, it's going to shape their perspective on life, it's going to shape how they, you know, re relate with other people as well. So for me, I would think, in my opinion, to in incorporating it within our school system as part of a history class we we'll call it social studies at primary level, would be a great way to just, you know, unite us, make us aware that we are actually one. Like we are aware of it because we are the same color, but at the same time, I mean, you've been in Uganda for a little while as well. Before you speak something, no one is going to, they look at you like you're Ugandan. It's until you say something and they're like, oh, they turn around like, oh, he sounds different, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, That's so true. I think, for me, I think education is important right from the primary level or kindergarten level, yeah. Okay. So I also wanted to ask, uh, in regards to this education thing, do you think that it will be considered African history if they do teach that in school, or would that be considered like uh, foreign history or, or foreign social studies or something like that? Would that actually be considered, you know, our ancient That's African, African history? history. I think okay. it would be considered you, as you African consider history. history but do you think people in school will consider that African history. That's what I, that's what I want to know. Repeat the question, repeat the question. I'm not, okay, I'm saying like, uh, from from your perspective, you, you already um, you already have like a Pan-Africanist mindset to a degree, because you've already done so much to break the bridge gap information. So from a non-biased perspective, do you believe that if these things are taught in school, would it be considered African history or would that be considered like some kind of foreign history that really doesn't have much to do with African people? You get what I'm saying? So like for the average day-to-day -day, uh, citizen of Uganda, for example. It would be considered as African history because we already they already teach us about slavery, the transatlantic slave trade. We already learn about that. So we are very much aware that very many Africans were taken away from Africa and sold as slaves, even by the African leaders themselves, the chiefs sold them at, at one point at some times. So we are very much aware of that. What we are not aware is what happened to them when they got there, you know? We don't know how they oh, fought, okay. you know, we don't know the wars that they fought, you know? We don't know how they later became free. They don't teach us that part. They only teach us until when they are taken maybe to Europe. There's this song that they teach ab ab about slave trade in America, working on sugar plantations and cotton plantations. We even sang it when we were in primary school. So we are very much aware that those are our people that were taken back in the day. We are aware of that. Mm -hmm. So it would still be African history. OK, OK. Yeah. That's a good answer. I appreciate that as well. Um, what does what is the significance behind Freedom Day here in Uganda? Could you explain that to me? Yes. So Uganda uh, was colonized by the British people, and uh, that is UK. 
and uh, were colonized. It started around 1888. There was the British Imperial East African Company that also started mm -hmm. in Kenya, it was within Eastern Africa. So they started by negotiating some trade deals, were also constructing the Uganda Railway, which was coming all the way from the coast up to Uganda. So that's how they penetrated Uganda. But before then, Christianity was already here. There was already Christianity, there were Catholic missionaries, you know, uh, uh, Anglican missionaries, Islam. But then even we also had Arab traders coming in as some people who were like explorers moving around. So we already had foreigners in the country. But then the colonization first came through that company, which was led by William Macnon. And then in, uh, I believe in 1894, he handed over the rights, the administrative rights to the British government. So that's when Uganda became colonized since then. And then, uh, wow. yes, it came all the way up to 1962. So how it happened, they started in central Uganda, where, which is where Kampala is located. Because before white people came, we had kingdoms, you know. We had Uganda Kingdom in central Uganda. We had Ankole Kingdom. We had Toro Kingdom. We had Bunyoro Kingdom. So we had our local traditional rulers, you know. We never had this modern day administration. We just have kingdoms. So the British started by coming into bed with the Uganda Kingdom, you know, and took over the Uganda Kingdom. And after that, they went into the West to all these different kings and kept on signing treaties and agreements with them to a point where they, they covered an area that is almost as equal as present-day Uganda. So that's how it started. And then uh, in 1900 or 1900, there is something called the Buganda Agreement that they signed. I don't know if you've read about it, if you've read about Ugandan history. Uh, oh, so... Yes, so the 1900 Buganda Agreement was between the British and the King of Buganda, but at that time he was an infant because in Buganda Kingdom it's passed on from the son, from the dad to the son to the son like that. So this king was mm. an infant at Dawudi Chwatu. So he's mm. um, let's say people who are doing decisions on his behalf are the ones who signed uh, this agreement. It also led into the dividing of the land. I don't know if you've heard like about Milo land. They divided the land in the kingdom as well into Milo land and the crown land. And they gave the Milo yeah. land to the leaders of the of the kingdom. Even then some people were, became like squatters, you know, on their own land. So they found a way to bribe these leaders. They gave them like salaries. are going to pay like 400 pounds, you know, per year. Uh, so they did all these tricks, you know, and found a way of administering their system in Uganda, even introduced people to start paying taxes, you know, to the kingdom. So they would find a way of bribing the leaders, you know, so that they can find a way of ruling them. You know, the leaders, like, make them, give them all these benefits, you know, pay ta people pay you taxes, you know, you're getting a salary, they reduced the powers of the king, and then they gave the powers to the Luchiko, the Luchiko was like a committee of all these traditional leaders, you know, within the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So that's how they did it, you know, and they were there until 1962. So in 1962, we gained independence. Uh, so the king, Edward Mutesa II, became our first president. And then Milton Obote, Dr. Milton Obote, was from northern Uganda. He became the prime minister. So uh, mm. that's how it happened, yeah. And then, of course, we later had, I mean, after that, there's like a little bit of chaos. You know, we had like very many presidents here and there. They wouldn't last long. And then we had Idi Amin, who was a very tyrant, you know, leader who came in 1972. About 71, mm. he wrote for about eight to nine years, from about 71 up to 1970 time. 79 but also bear in mind that during the time when the british were in uganda they also brought in very very many indians that's why we have a very big indian population in uganda yeah. indians yeah. were working on this uganda railway that was running from the coast up to uganda so when the british went about six thousand indians or even more stayed in uganda that's why i have very many indians in uganda and very many indians in, Ke in kenya as well yeah, i believe the indians in kenya are more than the Indians in Uganda. Reason being in 1972, Idi Amin declared an economic war, yeah. what he called an economic war. So he chased all the Indians yeah, out yeah, of the yeah, country. Yeah. He gave them a 90 day okay. ultimatum, you know, to chase them out of the country. So that's why the numbers mm -hmm. reduced. And his main concern was Uganda had gained its independence, yes, from the British, but Uganda was not economically independent, you know. Uh, all the jobs, you know, belong to the Indians, you know, when the, when we were under the British rule, the Indians were given a priority, 
they were the most educated, mm -hmm. natives were not educated, they had the good jobs, they were taking over the biggest sectors in the government. So I would say two thirds of Uganda's economy was being controlled by Indians. If you look at clips on YouTube in 1972, if you look at Kampala Road, you won't recognize that this is a street in Uganda. Everything was done by Indians. So I mean, yeah, felt yeah, like that different. was a threat. But I mean, was a tyrant. He was a very brutal leader. He killed uh, very many Ugandans as well, uh, very many people. And part of what he did was to expel all Indians out of Uganda. So he gave them three months to leave the country. Whoever didn't live in three months, he killed all those people. He was very brutal. I don't know if you've met, visited the torture house of Idi Amin. I'm not sure if you've seen it. No, no, it's no, no, near no. The I've, only about, um, I've only heard about what he did to the Indians uh, in Kabale uh, out in Lake Pignoni. That's about it. Yes. I haven't heard about all the other stuff. Uh, you know, it gets a little dark. And it's not I'm even the Indians only. Like so what happened? Idi Amin took over Uganda by coup. We had Milton Obota was a president. Idi yeah. Amin was the leader of the army. He was an army guy mm -hmm. because he had been trained by the British. He worked for the British when they were in power. He had, he had a lot of training. He had even fought the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya. So it was like this strong, powerful leader, but he was also not very educated. So I think that also gave him like a little bit of insecurity, you know? <laughs> so when he came to power, uh, Milton Obote had gone for a Commonwealth conference, I believe maybe in Singapore, in some Asian country. So when he had gone for a conference, I mean, accused him of all these things, you know, like tribalism, you're favoring the Langis and all that stuff. So he went on radio and declared himself the president of the country and said, Obote, don't come back. So for the next 10 years, he ruled by tyrancy, you know. If you're mm -hmm. sus suspected to be supporting, you know, Milton Obote, who just put you like on fire squad and kill you. He was a crazy guy. That's what I can say. He was a crazy guy. Yeah. So that's why he was very brutal because they had taken over power by a coup d'etat and he wanted to maintain mm. the power. So he had to do each and everything within his means. He killed very, very many people. Very, very, very many people. If you read yeah. about the story of Idi Amin, yeah. So, and then of course, later in 1979, funnily enough, Obote became the president again. <laughs> he came through Tanzania and kicked out Idi Amin. He ran away and ended up in Saudi Arabia in exile. So Obote became the okay. president again. And he ruled for a certain amount of time until, okay, there are very, very many presidents in between. Sometimes we'll be president like for 10 months, like for two weeks, like for three yeah. months, until Museveni came with his crew in 1986. And the guy has been president till today, so we don't know what his secret is. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. but I would say if you if I get back to your question, you ask me what does independence mean for us? We do celebrate 9th October as our independence day in Uganda. It's going to be 59 mm -hmm. years uh, this year since we gained independence. But of course, Uganda still has very many challenges. You know, you've been here for a little while. We are like more concerned about the economy, about unemployment rates, you know about the poverty, about like the healthcare, you know, about mm. teachers making very low salaries. Like we still have those concerns. It's one thing to be independent, but I think economic independence is is the biggest thing, you know, like it's the most important one. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I've noticed yeah. that here in UG, um, most people here, like they're more concerned with day-to-day -day things of, uh, you know, finances, take care of the finance, take care of kids, putting, you know, getting that commercial money basically. And um, I find that, you know, kind of interesting because I had a conversation with someone today and I told them that, you know, here in Uganda, you guys are to a degree. And I'm not saying this in a bad way, but you're privileged to not have to worry so much about history and stuff like that. Because in my country, where Sorry, we come from, it. we have the uh, historical things because uh, in my country, uh, in, in America, like we are plagued by, you know, our past and, and historical events and then every day, well, not every day, but quite often, you know, every year we're finding out new things that happen in our past that America has yet to answer for, you know? So coming here to UG, it was kind of a relief, but it was also kind of, um, it's kind of frustrating and disheartening to find out so many people who really don't, aren't really so concerned with uh, uh, like historical things, you know, that's going on. Like they're more concerned with political stuff that's going on today, but historical things of the past is, is not really, you know, that wasn't really a big of a deal. That was kind of why I really wanted you to be on this live because I wanted to see from a perspective of a Ugandan, 
why do you think that is? Why do you think um, it, there's so is a disconnection of uh, historical information here in UG? And then on top of that, um, a lot of people don't really know about the historical past. Be like uh, uh, pre-colonialism, they know a lot of stuff post-colonialism, but pre-colonialism before the colonists got here. Um, I, I don't really know of where I can go to get that kind of uh, education. I know some people have uh, oral information that they pass down in their family, within their clans and stuff like that. But as far as that goes, you know, I don't really know a solid source where we can go to and like say, okay, this is the historical things that happened in Uganda way before the first uh, whites or the first Indians or first Chinese. If that place doesn't exist, you let me know. But uh, can you explain a little bit about that disconnect uh, of uh, information? Why you know why history is not really that big of a deal? I know you, we already talked about it a little bit, but you can just brush up on it and kind of reiterate a little bit more. Okay, uh, that's interesting. So if I'm to recommend a place, there's a place called um, there's a museum in Bara. I mean, I'm sure you know Bara. Igongo, mm -hmm. have you been to Igongo Culture Center? It's in Bara. No, I've heard about that. I just recently heard about that. Uh, recently. Yeah. I think you could get a little bit of information. So I would say, I mean, us about our history, if you want to learn about history, we have to ask like your grandfather to tell you a story or your great grandmother, if you like it to have one. I have one, luckily enough. That's how you get to know yeah. about history. But in Uganda, okay. we don't necessarily care about history. I would understand why you Americans care about history because you're born in a land and you don't understand your environment, you know? you like, like, where yeah. am I? What are we doing? Where do we come from? So that's why you're very much concerned about your history. But we are lucky enough to be like, I'm born here. This is my home. Uh, this land was by my great grandfather. They migrated and came from Kavale and settled in Kanungu. This is why they bought. Then they gave this piece to my dad and then this piece of land to my uncle. And then we grew here. So we have that knowledge, I would say, you know? I have, okay, for me at least, like I can tell, like I know where my great grandfathers came from or my grandfathers came from, you know. I have been told that history from my parents. But I would necessarily say that people are not necessarily proud of their culture. They are proud of their culture, but not too much in that manner. Reason being, people are more concerned about making money. People are broke, you know. So <laughs> we are more concerned about making money. Where am I, where am I going to get the next shilling, you know? They are not mm. very much invested in their history because we know we know this is our cultural leader. This is how it was in the past. We had a king, you know. The Buganda know yeah. the Buganda people know their history very well. They can tell you they are kings all the way from the 1700s, you know. In, if you're in Western Uganda, you still know, like I know tribes in Western Uganda, they all came through Tanzania and Rwanda and settled in Uganda. So we are aware mm -hmm. of that history. But it's not something we are going to flaunt on a daily. We are just aware of it. You know, this is our land. This is where we are. I would say people are just okay. more concerned with other things. So if you're asking them about history, they would think like that's some boring stuff, you know? <laughs> okay. Think, like, oh, some boring I stuff. Okay. I mean, people are proud of like other dances, you know, the traditional dances. I love our traditional yes. dances. We are proud yes. of the food, you know, if it's like a traditional wedding, you know, like that's oh, when yeah, you I feel know about that, yeah. you know, their culture, about you know? Man, yes. Really so proud that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's when that's the chance when people get to express their culture when you have those functions. Even in Baganda, mm. they still have them. You know, when you give birth to twins in Baganda, they have like culture things that they do practice till today. Okay. They are there. Mm -hmm. We have culture name norms, you know. I recently, my yeah. mom was telling me that if I died today, for example, God forbid, I'm not married, I'm a single girl, they can't pass me through the front door of our of my father's house. They have, they have to make my, my dead body pass in the back door. That's something oh, I didn't, wow. but that's a culture thing, yeah. Oh, and then my brother has to get an axe and perform like some ritual. So trust me, people won't say those things, but when it's time to do mm -hmm. them, trust me, they will do them. They will do them secretly. You have your aunties, your grandmothers. They are there. They know that stuff. They will do it, you know. Mm. There are some cultural practices. When you give birth to a child, there are certain things. Of, of course, they'll bathe the child with herbs, you know. You won't see this stuff on social media. Like, they won't flaunt it. On, so, unless you're in Mama Tendo. There's a Facebook group called Mama Tendo. <laughs> Where oh, women try to talk about these things. Yeah. 
Mm. Ugandans are more on Facebook, if I, I'm sure you know that. So we yeah. are aware of them, but we don't flaunt it like that, I should say. But we also have specific occasions where we do celebrate our culture. Even like when you come to someone's home, I believe you've experienced this in the village, you know, they welcome you, give you a seat. to have like our culture things that we do. But when you ask the history necessarily, people might not be aware of the history because they just don't care. They have like better problems to worry about. In my opinion, right. that's what I think. But also bear in mind that Uganda is 80% Christianity. And with the coming of Christians into the country, they taught us a lot about God, you know, and being saved and being born again. I'm not saying there is anything wrong with that. You know, I believe in God personally. When it comes to religion, it's, it's a bit complicated. But something you've grown up seeing or grown up, growing yeah. up tuned to, they make you think that some culture things are negative. You know, you have to bear that in mind yeah. as well, that yeah. some culture things yeah. are negative. You know, you yeah. can't do them. But at the end of the day, our culture is still our culture. I can assure you, yeah. people still practice certain things in the culture. When you're getting married, they have your culture things that they do practice. For example, the Baganda, if your daughter is getting married, the woman, the girl's mother, you can't step there. You're not allowed to step there. You can't go to that function, that traditional function. Mm -hmm. You stay in the bedroom. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. So yeah, we do have you know, those. You know, so girl, she was Baganda, so I know about a lot yeah. of those traditions. <laughs> we do have them, you know? Yeah, people do them, but, but they just you brought up the, the, the point about religion, because uh, I've also experienced this uh, in America, how um, certain religions do influence uh, cultural ties and cultural history. And depending on, you know, what religion you're in, you might end up not uh, dealing with your cultural history at all or your, your uh, um, the things that your, your, your people do uh, as far as like, you know, traditions, basically. And I experienced this a lot here, uh, well, not here, but I experienced it a lot when I was in America. A lot of my family members are Christian and I have nothing against that. You know, that's religion, that's their choice. Uh, I personally was raised as one, but as I got older, I decided to you know, change my choice because, you know, I just wanted to explore uh, different options, explore different things that are out there. But that's a short version of my true uh, spiritual beliefs. But to make a long story short, um, I wanted to ask you about religions here and their effects on uh, that cultural history. Because in America, Islam, uh, depending on what type of uh, Islam you believe in, uh, whether you're like a percenter or uh, you're part of the nation of Islam or whatever, a lot of uh, people that I knew growing up who were Islamic people or who followed the Islamic faith, um, they still knew about their African history. In fact, they emphasized it in many ways, shapes, and forms. And um, I, can, I can tell you like a lot of uh, close brothers that I knew who either went to prison or did go to prison, um, a lot of them start to develop uh, beliefs outside of Christianity because Christianity um, wasn't really promoting a lot of like uh, pro-black and pro-African uh, uh, history and studies and things like that. You understand? Like I can remember listening to a lot of um, guys like when I grew up in New York. Uh, you would see guys on the street talking about um, uh, Prophet Muhammad and stuff like that and Allah. And in those same conversations, they were also preaching. Black studies and, and being proud of your black skin and your African ancestry and things like that. And um, then there are other people who uh, you know consider themselves Israelites who don't consider themselves like Africans at all, who are just completely separated from all of that. And I, I believe that that separation causes uh, um, a degrading of cultural ties. So is that the same kind of situation here in Uganda it, when people are really into their religion? Do they also forget about their cultural ties or do or is it that some of them that's just the way that they are or that's what I'm trying to understand. Is it the religion that's causing it or is it just their personal beliefs that are causing that separation and just completely abandoning their culture, uh, their culture or their tradition? I would say religion has a big influence in that, honestly, in my opinion, because um, in Uganda, people believe if you go to like the, the gods, let's say like you're a traditional healer, you know, or like a herbalist, mm -hmm. we have like one, some who are very popular here in Kampala in Uganda. Uh, we have like a leader. I don't know if you've heard of Mama Fina. Have you heard of Mama Fina? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Judge yes, Fina. I've heard of her. Yes. 
So she's very well known traditional leader. She's the leader of all the witch doctors, if I may say. I was Uganda. Her last night on some uh, herbal medicine. Yes. So she is their leader, you know. She is recognized for that. She's also a very wealthy woman because she solves people's problems, you know. Everyone knows if I have a problem with my husband, if I have a problem in my business, she, she I don't know if she does her thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But people go to her and she solves their problems, you know, and she makes money. That's her business, you know. So what I would like to say is Mama Fina, because she is a traditional leader or a traditional healer, she can't be seen going mm. to church. Those two don't connect. Because it's, it's known that if you're a traditional healer or traditional leader, you are evil. You have like evil spirits, you know, you deal with dead people. <laughs> Yeah, so she I've can't go to too. church. You can't be a, a witch doctor and then also be a religious person, you know? You can't. You have to choose one of the two. So I would say when people are very, very much into their religion, very much immersed into their religion, then it takes them away from their culture. But that is especially in Christianity. Because Christianity is yeah. very, very spiritual. Bear in mind, it's not like Islam. I, I, I hope you can understand that difference. Christians are yeah, very, very spiritual people. Christians believe they can pray for you if you're sick and you get healed immediately. Islam people don't do that. You understand the difference? Yeah. So it's like the levels, they are, they are completely different. I would say Islam, they just know, you know, of course, they're also very strict in their own way. You can't drink alcohol. You can't do all these things. But they're also more relaxed. You know, you can marry four wives as long as you can take care of them. So I would say when it comes to that, in Christianity to be specific, if you're religious, then you can't, because they believe some, custom, custom, some customs are evil, like some traditional things are evil. That's what they believe. Some things that, are, oh, yeah. that our ancestors are evil. Some, you know? that, uh, some of my Christian family members were telling me about coming to Africa and whatnot. So that's, you know, this, this is the reason why I'm asking these kind of questions, because I also feel like uh, different religions. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. By the way, I do apologize for that. But I just want to say that you know, some I, I found that religion has caused that disconnect, and it's caused people to have these negative assumptions about Africa that is just not true at all. And for people to find out that Africans have a big Christian or a big Islamic community, you know, some people get confused because they some people just believe that if you uh, most Africans just worship voodoo and, and stuff like that, or you know, worship orishas and or any of that stuff. And you know if that's that's their you know, that's, if that's their beliefs and that's their spiritual teachings that's their business, but that's not the case at all. You know, there's many different religions in this uh, in this this continent, and there's uh, many different types of beliefs and spiritual followings and stuff like that. So I just find that interesting how people think sometimes. But yeah, my family <laughs> they gave me hell, you know, for, for, not everybody though, but some people just say some some off the wall stuff, and it was just kind of frustrating, you know. So I would say people, some people are just very ignorant. They think Africa is one country, first of all. They don't know Africa has 54 countries, which are very, very diverse. The West, the East, the Central, the South, are all completely different from each other. But then what people don't know also is that Africa is very religious, you know. It's, it's very, very religious, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the biggest percentage are Islam, actually, followed by Christianity, followed by many other religions we have seventh day adventists we have even buddhists there are very that very many religions okay no not as such but that is practiced like by foreigners you know no, we have like, like, like a high right temple somewhere house. in kampala hmm? no i'm saying there's jehovah witnesses right right down the, yes yes literally we right also right have jehovah mountain. witnesses yeah, we even got yes. mormons out here yo. did you know that there's mormons out here there's what Mormons. Mormons? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yes, Mormons, so we uh, have very... They're, I, mean, I can't even explain it, but they're, uh, they're Christians, but a different type of uh, Christian. I don't even want to get into it. I can't explain it, but they're just, <laughs> it's hilarious to me. But anyway, moving forward. Yeah, so we have very, very many religions, but mm -hmm. we also have people who don't like religion or people who don't believe in religion. That is yeah. what you have to know as well, yes. So people who don't like religion or who don't believe in it 
or people who just think religion doesn't work. Because remember, there is a reason why people are religious. People are not just religious because of nothing, you know. People are religious because they believe God is going to provide for them wealth, you know. God is going to pro heal their diseases, you know. That's why pastors are very, very popular. They, they are very religious because sure they believe... Because they, they believe their lives can be made easy by religion, you know. Uh, pastors in Kampala sell hope. I always say, if we didn't have religion in Uganda, we'd have like very many suicide rates, you know. But because we have religion, when you go to church on a Sunday and the pastor preaches, if you if you felt like killing yourself in the morning, pastor is going to tell you, God is great, God is with you, he'll never leave you, nor forsake you, you can do everything through Christ who strengthens you. You feel encouraged, you know. When your kids don't have school fees, those words keep you moving. If there is no hope, everyone is going to die. So that's why people like religion. That's why people like Christianity, because life can be very difficult and very challenging. So they go there to get some sort of, you know, some sort of ease, you know, for their problems to be solved. Right. So, so people who believe that Christianity doesn't work or religion doesn't work, they'll go to the witch doctor. You know, they'll go to Mama Fina. Mama Fina, my husband is cheating on me. My wife left me. I like some girl. She doesn't like me. I need school fees. I need money. They also believe that's where they get their answers. So everyone okay. has what works for them at the end of the day. But I would say mm -hmm. a bigger percentage of people are religious, you know. And there are some people who do both. <laughs> there are some people who do both, actually. They could go to church, but they could also go to the witch doctor. So exactly I, i've known a few people who, who do that actually yeah because they there's people who have uh, those um uh, those uh witch doctors or uh people in their family you know and they still will go to those uncles or aunties or whatever and still ask for prayer or something like that and then still go to church on sunday or something of that nature so i definitely do understand where you're coming from with that and it's, that's kind of interesting that people play like that but you know <laughs> that's your belief so it is what it is some people want you know protection 360 so they go to this place and go to that place and you know it's yes that's too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit too much for me but um yeah i was uh i wanted to ask uh about i kind of got off subject because i was reading some of these comments here and uh someone was saying uh, uh sukusu was saying you have to have been born before 1970 to understand the history of the people of the world there were uh, there were strong beliefs in life, and I wanted to kind of ask about it. I don't I don't understand what that means, but to a degree I do understand because in America we had like the Black Panther movement and something like that. So what I wanted to ask you was like, have you guys ever had any kind of freedom fighters or or people who stood up for the people who were not associated with politics at all? Do you understand? No, in Uganda as a country. Yes, in no, Uganda. I, don't think so. no. I can't speak for the whole of Africa because there have been leaders all over, you know, like John Kenyatta and something like that. But mm. I want to know here in Uganda, have there ever been any leaders who aren't associated with politics who just stand up for the, the, the voice of the people or, you know, or the voice of people or stand up for the human rights or, you know, just the, the what people need? You get what I'm saying? And they're just not doing it with a political agenda. They're doing it just for the uh, the, the belief in it. No, so I would say uh, we don't. We don't because when Uganda came to independence, the leaders that we had, you know, they were, they were just leaders. You know, we had all these different political parties. We had the Kawakaika, which is for the king. We had a UPC, Uganda People's Congress, which was for Christians where Milton Obote came from, who had DP, Democratic Party. This party still exists till today. I'm sure you're aware of them, you know, apart from Noop, which came recently. But these parties came all the way from back, you know, UPC, DP, okay, Kawaka Eka faded out, right. you know, because that is Uganda Kingdom. But we don't have freedom fighters, you know? We don't have them like that. I would say the only person whom I would try to relate as a freedom fighter was Idi Amin because he never wanted anything to do with a British 
when Idi Amin was a president, he just wanted to deal with maybe Mama Gaddafi or the West or the Russia or Libya. Those are people he wanted to deal with, but we've not had. But as of today, we do have uh, human rights activists. You might not know them if you're not used to like Ugandan politics. We have them because Museveni has, when Museveni came to power in 1986, Uganda didn't have the basics, you know, they didn't have water, they didn't have electricity, we didn't have roads as such. Most of Uganda that, lacked that the basics, education. Absolutely insane to hear. You guys have the yes. biggest portion of Lake Victoria and y'all don't even have access to water? Yes, There's yes. water all so, throughout this entire country. I, that's, wow, <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, continue. Yes. Wow. So when Stephen came to power, Uganda didn't have the basics, I would say, at least for the most part. You know, things like electricity, you know, soap, uh, sugar, things like that. They weren't there. So when he came, he managed to organize the country and bring the roads and bring the education and all those things. That's why every time Seven is making a speech, he wants to remind you of the condition that it was before 1986. That's why very many Ugandans love Museveni. Even when you have Bobby Wine, the young people love Bobby Wine because we've only experienced Museveni's regime. I can assure you, my parents love Museveni. They'll vote for Museveni until they die. That's an assurance. <laughs> and it's not only my parents, it's a very big percentage of them. If someone saw the days of Idi Amin Dada, he was cruel. He wanted to make the entire country Islam. That was his agenda before they took him out. So, like, you can't compare those two regimes, you know. Museven has brought peace, apart from northern Uganda, which has been stable for a certain period of time. He has brought education. People can trade. Uganda is the most peaceful country in the region. I believe you can agree with me. You will see Somalis here, Eritreans, Ethiopians, yeah. Congolese. We everyone comes to Uganda. There's a little stuff going on here and there, but compared to other countries, it's yes. more stable. Yes, than other countries. If you try to oppose the president... It's not warfare. <laughs> If you try to oppose the government, then you're going to disappear, you know? So just mind your business, do your work. So people, people didn't complain, you understand, you know? So it's mm -hmm. until us, the young people who have been born in the 70s regime, we see countries like maybe, let's take an example of maybe Singapore or Dubai built in 25 years. And you're like, see what this country has built in 25 years? Our Uganda is still stagnant. So there is something called diminishing returns if you studied economics. When you reach the peak, mm -hmm. you start to slope down. It's, it's obvious, like there is no more going up, you know? So that's what is mm -hmm. happening to Uganda right now. But it's us, the young people who are complaining. <laughs> you know, because okay. we know better. We've seen Museveni's regime throughout. You can't tell us of the days of Idi Amin. We never saw that. We just have read history. I have read history as well about Idi Amin. I've watched a few clips on YouTube, you know, try to learn how his rule was, what he did. But someone who experienced it, my parents and my grandfather, they were like, you know what? I'm seven is cool. I'm good. Mze, you should be there forever. You know, they're not complaining. So it's only the Bazukulu, that's how Mseven calls the young people, who are complaining. Yeah, Why? Mm -hmm. Because we've seen better. We know the country can be better. We can't believe how the corrupt the country is. We can't believe we don't have any industries. We have resources that are unutilized. All the money is embezzled. But the problem we have is we don't have power. Okay, yes, we do have power if you all come together. But at the same time, we don't have power as well. M7 has guns. You know, if you try to go to the street, you'll get shot. In Uganda, M7 doesn't play. It's just how it is, you know. I believe Kenyans can riot. <laughs> Don't try that stuff in Uganda. I believe you saw what happened last year, you know, during the elections when people were rioting. I believe they killed like 50 people within like two days or 52 people. There is there is a report by BBC, you know, that they did that is on YouTube. You I watched know? the whole documentary. I watched the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, we so ain't gonna talk right about it. Y'all know what they're talking <laughs> about. It's a BBC documentary and Vice yes. did a documentary on uh yes. situation so that happened. Yeah, so we do have young activists, I would say for sure. We do have them. Some are in the country, some are not, you know, because of your safety as well. But they are there, a number of them for sure, you know. And of course, Bobby Wine is the most, I would say maybe most courageous one because <laughs> he's out there trying to oppose the old man openly. But back mm. in our history, according to the way our history is, we don't have, like, in that manner, the way you asked me, Yes, I understand. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, 
I, I wanted to say for my final statements, and I'll let you get a chance to say your final statements. I wanted to say that this is one of the reasons why I actually did this live. I feel like it's important that we talk about stuff like this because Uganda has a very young population. And on top of that young population, I feel like historical events, in my opinion, because of where I come from, historical events are extremely important to not only know about, but oftentimes reflect on so that you are not, you know, going to be destined to repeat the same um, mistakes or situations. Now, I honestly feel like one of the reasons why Ugandans get taken advantage of so much in a lot of different situations is because of the lack of information and transparency in education. So that is just my personal opinion of what I've seen and experienced being here in UGG for the, for the time that I've been here. So um, if you can, just give me your final thoughts on, on uh, the situation of what we just talked about as far as freedom and how we can uh, bridge that gap of information of freedom moving forward so that, you know, Ugandans uh, don't, aren't destined to, you know, repeat the same mistakes of their past, basically, and if it's important for them to know it or not. Uh, my personal take would be the education still, in my opinion. I think it's very easy to change things, or it's very easy to have a change when people are aware, you know, when people are educated the right way. So what they teach us at school is not empowering in any way, I do believe. So if you want to have a generation of people who are going to stand up for themselves, who are going to say we won't have foreigners, you know, uh, taking our resources from us, yet we are just seeing we don't want, you know, young men and women leaving the country to go and look for jobs. That's what happens to Uganda every day. You see them lining up at internal affairs, you know, to get passports. They're going to Saudi Arabia, they're going to all these crazy countries, you know, to find jobs, you know. So in my opinion, it comes back to education. You have to teach the people. You have to educate them the right way. And I think our education doesn't do us any justice, really. It's, uh, it just needs to be revised. You know, when it becomes revised and people learn better, then they will see better. It will happen naturally. You know, if when everyone is awake, then it will just be like some sort of revolution and things will come together the way they're supposed to be. I would say it's the same thing with like, if we are told that these are our people in the diaspora, you know, they were taken. This is how they gained independence. Let's celebrate them as, as well each and every year. Then we are aware that they are a part of us. If they want to come to Uganda or if they come to Uganda, then it will be very, very easy, you know, for us to embrace them. Right now, I'm embracing them. That's why you have connect with Uganda because I want it to be easy. You know, if people are coming to Uganda, I don't want them to be scammed if they're trying to get land or if they don't know whom to call, you know, things like that. I am trying to help, but it should be a lot, a lot easier if it was taught in school. So I think a lot has to be changed in education. In my opinion, it's not even that only. It's very, very many things you know, that we could talk about the entire day, but education at school, you know, okay. it has to be incorporated okay. in the system. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. If you can, yeah. drop your hand in for me. Let everybody know where they can find you, where they can follow you, so they can connect with Ray and connect with Uganda, please. <laughs> yes, so I'm a YouTuber as well. My channel is Connect with Uganda. You just type it in, and you will see it. I'm helping African-Americans, mainly people from the diaspora, Africans from the diaspora. If you want to visit Uganda or relocate or even try to settle here or start a business, I'm here to help you guys. So feel free to check out my channel, watch some videos, uh, send me an email. I'll be happy to connect. Yeah. I'm also on Instagram as well at Ray Kembawazi. That's my personal page. I have a new page for the channel as well. So yeah, that's about it. I'm on Facebook, but I rarely respond to Facebook. So YouTube is better. <laughs> yeah, YouTube. I stick to YouTube and Instagram nowadays. Yeah. All right. This has been a very wonderful and educational uh, episode of live. Um, I definitely appreciate you joining in with me and uh, giving your thoughts on uh, Juneteenth, freedom, and many other things, challenges we have to overcome here in Uganda, but not just as Ugandans, but as Africans, uh, you know, diaspora and here on the continent. And uh, the more that we do these lives, the more we have these kind of conversations, the more gaps that we are bridging of information. So once again, I do appreciate you for coming on today, and hopefully I will have you again next time. You know, we always do these anyway, so... I definitely will have you in uh, another time if you have another topic or something of that uh, nature. Family, if you guys uh, really like uh, this kind of content, something of that nature, if you enjoy watching uh, Ray Kim Bozzi, go ahead and follow her, please. Go to uh, all of the platforms, subscribe, uh, follow, like, all of that good stuff. Uh, other than that, 
I will go ahead and end this live now. Y'all have a blessed one today. If you're my channel, subscribe now. Give me a thumbs up on this episode if you like it. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. If you have any thoughts on this, or if you need thoughts on the next video that we might have. So, y'all holla at me. All right? Everybody else, y'all have a blessed one today. Peace. Bye, guys. Thank you.